and we're live. All right. Well, welcome to the stream. Um, my name is Red Ragged Fiend. You can call me Red Fiend if you want. Um, basically here to do primarily D and D and TTRPG related content. A uh, brand new streamer trying to get into it a little bit. Have some friends that are doing it, but hey, maybe maybe I'll do it. Uh, help me I'm doing sort of DM prep and working on things in the background anyways. So it seemed like, well, if I could put it online, that it kind of reaches out to more people. People will kind of find the content that way. Uh, so while maybe new to streaming, I'm not new to sort of content creation. Uh, you can see sort of my website down at the bottom. I've been blogging about D&D and TTRPGs and sort of the industry for, I guess, about... 10 years, maybe a little over, maybe 11 years now. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the, the background here, sort of what what I'm planning to do, sort of through streaming through Twitch and YouTube and see, uh, you know, if this is sort of content that people are interested in, see if I can sort of transition that content from written to spoken and sort of make it a little bit more interactive. Uh, so. A little bit of notoriety sort of on the content side, not not a ton, but you know, people know who I am, people read my articles, talk to people about things, uh, so I just kind of want to bring that over to make it a more direct, interactive sort of link. Uh, so for today, what we're going to mainly focus on, as the title says, we're going to build sort of a sandbox. I figured I'd do sort of a new solo RPG kind of series, see if people are sort of into that content. I've done a, a big write-up on it over on, on the blog, so redragonfeed.com. Go there, you can read sort of the backstory sort of about um, not only how to sort of play Dungeons & Dragons by yourself and other TTRPGs, but also if you are a dungeon master or game master, or you're somebody who's thinking that maybe you want to try that out, I found that solo RPGs really help you make that easier really make that easier that transition because it kind of doing it by yourself putting all that sort of impetus on you to make that content for your own adventures uh really kind of transitions your mindset into that sort of dm mindset so you can kind of start to understand how you construct adventures and campaigns and encounters uh so they're fun to play and the great thing is that you get to battle test it right there right you get to make an encounter play the encounter and you're like oh that was fun or you're like, ugh, that was kind of a vlog. I think I'm going to do something different next time. Uh, but for today, particularly, our goal is to create sort of a sandbox that'll be sort of the start for this new solo RPG series. So that's sort of our goal. And the reason we're, we're doing that is because one of the things that's hardest to do in solo RPGs, and especially for new people, is growing momentum. Um, I, I feel like, and I've heard most people's stumbling steps when it comes to playing D&D &D or another tabletop RPG by themselves, um, whether it's because you can't find a group or you just want extra playtime or whatever the situation is, um, is that one of, the, one of the biggest stumbling blocks is that, all right, I create the character, now what? Right, and especially if you don't have sort of that DM background, that DM sort of experience, that can be very difficult to just start with a blank page. So this is going to kind of show you sort of what I've used, and I've done this sort of set up for both solo RPGs and campaigns I've run. Um, just sort of the process that I find pretty useful, and I think maybe if you're somebody who's in the same boat because you want to play by yourself, or you want to um, get into DMing, or you just kind of want to want to have a better, um, a more more substantial system, sort of a backbone for your DMing if you feel like, you know, you're just kind of throwing ideas at the wall all the time to see what sticks. And kind of give you a structure and a process for that. Um, so yeah, that's it for right now. Uh, of course, if you guys have any questions, you jump in, talk about things, uh, but that's sort of the main things we're going to go over today. Uh, let's see, what else do we kind of have on the docket? Let me make sure that I've got everything down. Um, I think that's, that's sort of the main points. 
and, and I followed plenty of creators uh, that are sort of in the space as well. Um, so it, I saw sort of the the latest video from XP to level three over on YouTube, where you know they do a little skit about OP spells. Uh, heat metal is one of my favorite spells. Uh, it's it's a killer low level spell in D and D five e. Always looking for you know people that are, have really big weapons or like encased in armor or you know constructs or anything that uh, heat metal becomes a, a fantastic tool at low levels to just sort of um, control enemies as well as just deal damage that can't be saved from. Uh, it's, it's fantastic spell, one of my favorite. Um, as well, you know, cloud of daggers, anything, those sort of spells that aren't aren't the sort of go-tos necessarily for everybody, right? People are like, oh, I want to take burning hands or things like that, but there's lots of other smaller utility spells where if you think about it and think about situations that are probably um, more common than you might think, you can, they kind of show up, you can take care of it that way. <laughs> Rather than just, you know, always, you know, Oh, it's my turn, I cast Burning Hands, or whatever you're doing, or Magic Missile or something. Not that I don't love Magic Missile. I love Magic Missile to death. <laughs> it's always great, it, you know, force damage, plus no saves, no attack roll. You just do damage, which is always nice, especially if it, you're dealing with somebody who's hard to hit, or an enemy that's got a ton of resistances. Um, because almost nobody is resistant to force damage and magical force damage. So, yeah, great spell on its own. But let's go ahead and switch over and start uh, talking about sort of the hex map and what we're going to do there. So here we have sort of our, our setup um, for right now. Let's we'll switch that over. Um, one of the first things we kind of want to do uh, in, our, in our Word document here is look at... Specifically, where do, where, where do we want to start our adventure? So I have um, this this document that I created that I've used a whole bunch. That's sort of a a 15 minute campaign start document. Um, I already have some other documents that we're going to work through, so I didn't pull it up for the stream today. Um, but this is it's it's a very simple thing. We'll walk through it. It'll be no problem. Uh, so the first thing we kind of want to figure out is sort of the kind of major biome that we're going to be working out in. Like, where are we going to start this adventure? This campaign? Whatever it's going to roll into. Whatever it's going to grow and become organically. Um, so the first thing we do is sort of figure out that, that primary biome, biome, that climate that we're going to work in. And so for that, we're going to hop over here to our little dice roller. Go. Um, and so I kind of have it set up as a 1d12 roll. Let's see what we get kind of to start out. All right, that's eleven. So that's some sort of uh, lowlands, sort of valley, a canyon, some sort of basin. And then we uh, we roll again to sort of figure out. We'll do that with the D10 uh, to still figure out the biome of sort of, sort of this depression that we're going to be in. Eight. Okay, a tropical grassland. So we've got sort of a savanna kind of setup that's sort of like you know I'm gonna just get, I think I'm gonna go with like a base it's gonna be like sort of a large bowl it's gonna have some highlands around and maybe some mountains hills things of that nature to kind of rush down into it uh, so it's sort of like this verted pocket maybe sort of like a pocket valley or a little pocket basin that's in the middle of a mountain range or something so it's gonna be kind of an interesting start like that so let's go ahead and get that down um, so sort of our Start. We have our Atlas X, and that's going to be a tropical grassland. Depression uh, or basin. All right. Uh, and so to kind of talk about sort of the world building that we're going to be using, oh, you guys can't quite see that, can you? Let me let me get that adjusted. Not the one up. There we go. There we go. I think I should be able to see that a little bit easier. Uh, so that's sort of our start. 
Uh, so what we're going to talk about is sort of the way that we're going to be doing the world building here. So the world building, if you're familiar with that and doing that for like D&D or whatever, writing books, whatever, um, there are basically two kind of primary approaches. Either you do a top-down approach or a bottom-up bottom up approach. With a top-down approach, basically, if you can think about it as like, You've probably seen it in movies and TV shows, sort of like that satellite image where you start off seeing the whole earth and then you see it zoom all the way into like a house and a person. Um, so that's sort of top down. The idea is you start the world building by creating the world and the cosmos and then you slowly chunk down and be like, okay, so I go from the world to a landmass or a continent and then to like a country within that and then or a region within that, and then a country within that, and then, you know, a, a province or a state within that, and kind of keep drilling down um, until you get to, like, a local village with fields around it or whatever, because we're doing a very fantasy-esque um, RPG, so that's what we kind of consider, like, the very bottom local level. And if, over on my website, I've been working on this world-building process post over the past couple of years, Kind of working on that um primarily top down based right um and then bottom up is basically exactly the opposite right basically you're like we're going to start off with a, a village or our characters homes and then we're going to sort of build out and as we play we discover more about the world um so there are two different approaches and what we're going to do here is sort of split the middle uh, we're basically going to make what I call sort of a lazy bee. So we're basically going to drill straight down on one pinpoint level. So we don't we don't need to know the whole continent. We need to know specifically about this spot. We're going to drill that all the way down, and then we're just going to slowly expand up um, through play. But doing that initial drill down will give us enough sort of context in the world, sort of around where we're starting, that it's going to feel a little bit more cohesive, or at least that's been my experience, that it feels a little bit more cohesive in that, make, in that sort of process. Uh, so we're starting off, and so to do that, it comes at levels, which is basically what I was getting to. So that's the Atlas Hex. So that's sort of how my world, top-down world building is set up, is sort of like um, incremental hex maps. And the Atlas Hex map is the biggest and it's about 316 nautical miles and we use nautical miles and that's a whole thing um we can talk about that on some other stream uh but basically for math's sake we use nautical miles instead of statute miles or normal miles uh or kilometers just because the math works out so much easier because it's based off of uh nautical miles are fit directly with degrees of latitude and longitude, which makes scaling between looking at the world view and looking all the way down to like the local view much, much easier from a math perspective. Uh, so we have sort of our start, right? We have our Atlas Hex. We're going to build that down. Um, so I think at this point, that's all we've got right here. Um, Let's go ahead. All right. Well, first, we want to know. We want to know, and we'll go ahead and pop over here. Um, one second. There we go. We're going to go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and go to the full screen so we can get a little bit better look at everything we're looking at right now. All right. Here we go. We'll hop back over to the full screen. Um, and you can see, this is the program that I like to use for mapping, it's called HexDML. Um, it's a nice little web app, hexdml.playtest.net. Uh, it's very easy, you can save local saves to it and everything. Uh, so I find it very, very useful and it's very, and it's free, which is the best price, right? Uh, so I'm going to go over here in settings, I switch that in hex orientation. I take off adaptive size because I don't like the way their adaptive size thing works. Um, and that's down mm, to 20, at least for right now. 20 by 20. So 
at that size. We have what we're looking at. Alright, so we're kind of working up here. Let's see. So we said that we are going to start off in sort of a basin, but it's sort of a grassland. Grass? Or I like to use um, the grass color instead of the actual grassland, or everything ends up having an icon on it, which is kind of difficult to parse in larger maps. Which kind of dump this off. Well, we only need a few around it, so let's do. Uh, yeah, this is good. Let's do that here. All right, so that's sort of our our basic starting point. Um, also, we need to. I like to figure out the area around it. So right now, this this represents an atlas hex, which from basically side to side is about six degrees of longitude and latitude across, or about. 360 nautical miles. So it's a large area. Uh, we're definitely not going to explore very much outside of this as far as um, the solo RPG actual play goes. Unless we get up to, into the higher levels, usually D&D parties don't end up traveling all that much. Uh, certainly not making like a hundred plus miles overland trip. Uh, it could happen, so it's nice to know sort of what's around just in general. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. Uh, but we do know that we're going to have uh, some mountains here. So I'm going to say maybe there's like a 50% a chance that each each of these little blocks, each of these little hexes around us is going to be a mountain. Or, or I guess a hill. A hill or a mountain. Uh, let's just do, let's just roll um, D3. We got, uh, what, six around this? So let's roll a d3 on a one to two. Uh, it's going to be something else. On a three to four, it's going to be hill. And on a five to six, it'll be a mountain. So, mountain, hill, hill. Pretty easy to parse. Let's put this in the mountain. Right there. Hill's going around it. Perfect. Uh, two, three more. Alright, so we got a plane, we got some hills, we got another plane. Right. So you can see that sort of like our starting area is sort of couched in this highlands, right? So it's not necessarily a basin, so let's let's change that. This looks very much like um very much like a very large U-shaped valley that's kind of in between a mountain range or kind of splits through a lowland and some sort of fracturing during uh, plate tectonics or something like that that's kind of created this sort of rip that kind of runs through the middle which is kind of cool so let's go ahead and let's see yeah uh, a valley of some sort I'm kind of working through uh very cool now one of the things that i like to do is i like to also work on the biomes as well hey perfect Hey, Gregor's man. Thanks for jumping in and following. Hope you're enjoying it. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and drop that in. Um, so basically what we're doing right now is we're doing uh, some solo RPG setup. We're doing some, some very basic world building, kind of doing some top down and then bottom up world building to kind of set the stage for the solo RPG we're going to be running later. Uh, so right now we're working on sort of the basic area that we have. Uh, and then we're gonna get a little bit more specific with the details going on later. Uh, so yeah, that's where we are right now. So let's just hop back into it. Uh, so one of the things I wanna do is I wanna sort of like differentiate some of this biome, especially for these sort of low land hexes. Are they all gonna be grass? Maybe some, maybe they're gonna be something else. Um, is this gonna be a hex crawl? Uh, yeah, for the most part, it'll be, a, it'll be a hex crawl. It'll be a very sort of organic thing that we're gonna build. Um, but I want to basically set this uh, a baseline. One of the things I talked about earlier is that we want to set a foundation because what's really hard, especially with solo RPGs, um, is making a character and then trying to figure out the adventure. So I want to give us a starting point for that adventure first. And then as we explore more, there'll be more of those hex crawl elements where we discover things along the way. But for the beginning, I want to make sure that there's sort of a, a little sandbox for us to play in. So it's not, you know, me scratching my head going, oh, I don't know, maybe we go this way, maybe we go that way, because that's not super entertaining, both to play for myself 
and for anybody to actually watch me try to figure out what to do. <laughs> uh, but we want to roll some 2d6, I think, here. Just do some biome um, deviations. Let's do that. All right, well, that's not going to deviate. Uh, that will. Um, it's going to be more verdant. And that'll stay the same. All right. Uh, and those are over here on this map where we talked about it. So it tends a little bit drier. Uh, so we're going to have this nice. So this is actually what we've got down here. It's sort of like a, a sort of like scrubland. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more sort of Mediterranean chaparrales. Very almost deserty, not quite deserty. Uh, so let's go ahead and a little color down there for that. Well, just so we know that's what that is. Perfect. All right, so now what we want to do is sort of drill down in this middle square, which is what middle hex, which is where we're going to start. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so we've got our hex, so let's just go ahead and do this. So, and hold on. That's sort of we're taking that next level down. So these these atlas hexes in the corner they represent a very large area. They represent about 360 nautical miles, which is uh, 400 425 statute or normal miles, sort of across. And we're just doing this to give us some context for sort of the world building going forward. Now we're going to zoom down a level, um, and we're basically going to to figure out oh actually before we do that let's jump back over and let's figure out if there is any sort of atlas hex let's figure out if there's a big city around here somewhere um let's let's hop back uh, so we can figure that out sort of over here i've done this so many times uh, let's see what am i looking for there we go Sexy. Uh, so is this on the coast? Obviously not, because of the center. The hexes around it are none of those are oceans. Uh, so it's not a temperate coast. Is it a land hex? Yeah. Is it a water or ice cap hex? Yeah. All right. So let's roll a d100. If we get uh, 76 or better, there's gonna be something in there. 19. No. Okay. Just making sure. We don't need to worry anything else about that. So. Basically, those Atlas hexes means that there's no sort of like large capital city or a sort of major fortification. We're talking about like a significantly large fortification, those sort of ones that are sort of like worldwide known. So we don't really have any of those, which is good. That means that this is going to put us more in that sort of frontier marches area rather than lap dash in the middle of a big city. Uh, so that'll give us a lot more sort of standard D&D-ish adventures um, to kind of go through, which I think will be helpful for the solo RPG stream. All right, so we don't have anything in there, so we need to jump down here. It's sort of our regional hex, and so we have that, um, and then we'll, we'll dive down a little bit, but we really only want to know, because we're going to do a central dive down. I guess we didn't really need all these extra hexes. Let's go ahead and I'll get rid of these right now. I really only need to know kind of what's going on in the middle here. And I just need another one. Another one of these little hex flowers. This is going to be sort of our, our middle level. Uh, so yeah, let's go. Let's do, our, let's do our 2d6 rolls again just to see if there's anything different there. And going around. Uh, five, is five burdened? Here we go. You think you wouldn't forget because you know you make it, but you do. Uh, all right, yeah. So it's gonna be a little bit more burden. Okay, what's more burden than that? Well, then we go back to place. That's perfectly fine. Roll again. All right, another grassland. Oh, and then even more. Interesting. All right, so we got another grassland here, and then what's next to that is that we're gonna have. So this is a 
tropical sort of area that we know we're in. I'm gonna do that, but I'm actually gonna give that this color. Well, um, because it's gonna be sort of a dry forest, so it's gonna be forest some of the time, but it's also gonna be grassland some of the time. It's got a very tropical feel to it. So, going. Okay, we got a mountain. Should be perfectly good. And we're gonna have something that is fine. Destroyer, right? We have a mountain. We put our mountain in there. And then we're gonna have an actual desert. Go ahead and use the desert. Right here, we got one more, and we'll go back to that mountain. There's one little piece we gotta do with that mountain. Alright, and 10, which is twice. Yeah, twice dry. Well, there's not really anything drier than a desert, so it's just gonna be a desert. <laughs> uh, Alright, so we got desert, desert, desert. Uh, and then we roll, I believe it's a 1d10, right? Yep. 10% chance that that's a volcano. On a 10, it'll be a volcano. Alright, it's a volcano. No, no, no. Uh, so, luckily, we have a little volcano icon. And this is a hex HexDML. It's a, a free-to-use sort of web app uh, for making hex maps. Uh, I use it pretty often uh, for things on my blogs and my own games. Uh, so it's, it's a fun tool. Uh, it's not, not perfect. I haven't found a, a hex map creator that is perfect yet. Uh, but it is good and it's free and it's easy to use. You can make local saves of your maps, which is always nice. Uh, and go back to them and load them back up and make changes and save them and load them. Which is extremely useful rather than just having to print them out and recreate it every time. Uh, so that's it. So we've got our little thing here uh let's see um is there gonna be anything here okay, well actually technically we're in the wilds aren't we if there's a poi in this wild so poi stands for a, a point of interest let's see if there's there's any sort of point of interest in here um all right because it's only on a one or two. Let's see if there's one or two. There is. Okay. Uh, so we need each one. What do we got going on here? Uh, a nine. All right. Nine. Okay. We've got some sort of meeting place, which is sort of the central area that we've got here. Hmm. Let's see. I think I like this trading post crossroads market. I think that's a really nice way to sort of start off a solo RPG. So it's not quite a village, so it's basically just sort of a wide spot in the road as people travel through. Um, but it is an outfitter. We can get our regular, our sort of basic gear there for an adventuring, and uh, there'll be people passing through that'll have quests and things to do, I think that'll be a really nice start, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Go here. Do. Number. What am I looking for? Or... This will give us a little overview text and kind of see what we're looking at here. Uh, so we've got a trading post. Okay. Need to select it first. Select. There we go. Now we'll be able to see it. We know there's a trading post there. Perfect. We know that that's going here in the middle. Throw it down real fast right now. We'll do that same thing. Uh, where we're gonna, we're gonna figure out some, some biome diversity. We get closer here. Hold those. Seven. Perfect. All right, so that's gonna keep us where exactly where we are. It's gonna keep us where we are. 
four is going to be twice more burdened. Yep. So this does the same, this does the same, what's more burdened, so that's plain, so we're going to have another one of these sort of dry forests again here. Alright, we'll have a desert as well. Oh, and then a wetland thing. Okay, so we've got our desert here, and then we're gonna have uh, what looks like probably a marsh given our circumstances. Then we got two more. Same. Oh, and water. Interesting. Okay, so two um, on that sort of hex map, I can go over and we can look at it real fast. Um, on this biodiversity, so two is always water, and three is the wetlands. Alright, so we've got, um, so this is going to stay standard, but what actually changes here, that our central here, since we, we sort of branch down from our trading post, so there is actually some sort of water feature here, which is very interesting. Um, so I'm guessing that there's some sort of, maybe it's sort of an oasis, there's a fresh water stop, and that makes sense of this trading post may be something more like a caravanserai. Um, so it's actually a place where people are coming through the region because we're working in a relatively dry area. Uh, so it's a place for them to sort of stop and get water and trade and move on with their journey. So interesting, but I like it. I like where it's going. Okay, and then we can sort of drop down to our primary, our primary hex. I'm going to need some more space, I think. Let's go ahead and edit that real quick. Over here on the right. Let's go 35 just to be safe, but I think we should be. Alright, um, here we go got water actually so four five and three this is great so this is sort of our our local hex level um so at this point each one of these hexes is about a league across or i talk about it being about um it takes an average group of about an hour to cross one of these hexes. So now we're down to the quite local level. Um, and so let's kind of see what the biome diversity is. And then I'm hoping we're going to get at least one land, or else we're going to. This is going to be kind of weird. <laughs> Means that this trading post is going to be on what, like a tiny island, <laughs> which is interesting, but hard to get to, <laughs> rather than it being on the shore. Uh, so. Let's do our biome diversity one more time. I know, it, it kind of takes a little bit. Alright, uh, five. So, that can't be any more burdened than water. So basically, at this point, we, we're trying to catch things that are nine or higher. Uh, so that's one. Two. Three. Four. Okay, so four and five are going to be drier than water, which means they're going to be wet. Yep. Now we know there's at least some place for this trading post to actually stand that's not a tiny island <laughs> in the middle of this water, which is good. <laughs> um, let's finish this up real quick. Okay, then we got some hills. Over here. Right? Is that right? No, that's not right. Um, so that's actually too drier. Sorry about that. That's actually a little grassland. So this may be actually a little bit of, of land that's pushing into the water there. That may be where the training post is. It's kind of defensible. It may be like a little peninsula that's sticking out. Uh, so that may be, end up being where this training post that we're going to start all our adventures at is going to end up. Um, back, one, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, nine, and then okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we had that, and that was a ten, which is two drier again, which means we got another little breath, and then here, just two more. We got a wetland, that'll work. And then we'll also have another little, another little marsh that's down here. That's sort of our start off play area. And I think we can go ahead and drop, let's drop a symbol down here. Um, I think for right now, we'll use this symbol. We can use these little, this little stamp tool to make a symbol. One of the hexes. So I think we're going to make, um, I like this one, I think, because it's butted up against dry land and the mountain. Eh. Yeah, I think I'm still going to put it here. Alright, so that's going to be our sort of trading post. Now we know that. Alright, uh, so that gives us a start off, so we have... Down at the local level, let's go ahead and go down. So we've got that at the regional level, so it's it's a pretty big trading post, is what that tells us. It's gonna be a pretty big trading post, pretty major one. And so, anytime that we hit sort of um, a a big point of interest. That drills all the way down, so we don't keep rolling for additional points of interest within the same hex. Um, so we know, so that's why we don't need to look at one at sort of this level here where we found out where the water is. Um, off to the left there, because we know there's already a trading post in there, so we don't need to roll for it again. That sort of builds us all the way down. So we kind of know what our central location is, and we kind of know the placement of it. Which, um, if we didn't know that stuff, we'd do it in here, but we lucked out and we actually got a higher level point of interest, so we don't need to use a lot of this in the, the sort of 15 minute campaign start document that I have, so we can kind of jump ahead, uh, which is nice. Nice. Uh, I guess, take a break real quick while I look this over, um, answer if you guys have any questions. Uh, anything like that uh, what you have going on in your lives you know how are you doing this at least it's Sunday for me mm, just throwing some nice coffee all right yeah so we'll just break down well yeah let me know if uh, you have questions or anything that you guys want to talk about that's always great i'm always happy to jump in and answer those and otherwise we'll just kind of keep trucking along but fill myself in sort of the echo chamber talking to myself which is weird <laughs> weird but you know part of what you do hmm Perfect. Um, so we're good right now on looking at the hex map. So I'm actually going to hop over and we'll take a look um, back at sort of a little spot back over here. Pop that up for right now. Um, there you go. So yeah, uh, let's see. What else to talk about before we just kind of roll into it. It really feels good to sort of uh, sort of make up my own sort of solo RPG thing. I kind of fallen off the solo RPG I was doing by myself earlier, and right now I'm currently playing in two campaigns, but I'm not running a campaign right now. I haven't run anything um, 
in 2023. So, wow, other than one shots. I haven't run like a campaign or long term adventure yet. It's nice to sort of like do this DM prep stuff. I really like this stuff. I know a lot of DMs and don't really like prep work, but I like, I enjoy prep work. Uh, it feels like this own sort of like subsystem game I get to play in D&D &D, um, outside of when I'm playing with my friends. Yeah, it's a, maybe, maybe that's just me, but that's how I look at it and enjoy it. Um, let's jump in, let's go ahead. All right, so we know the region, we know our county. Yeah, this is the same training post. And then our local. Because it just, like I said, it just kind of drills all the way down. All right. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about the training post. How many people live in a training post of that size? Hmm. Well, I know from sort of our. And sorry, that's going to screw up the coordination a little bit. Um, I know from. Just double check. So, because it's a region, um, this is kind of going to be a village size. So, there's going to be a village attached to sort of this major trading post. Uh, so, we want to know how many people are in it. Well, um, at least for my D, &D world building, I, I take um, villages to mean up to a thousand people. So I think we'll just roll this as sort of a 1d10 to sort of figure out the hundreds. Right, 200. So a population of about 210. A little low, that would be more of a hamlet size. Um, let me roll that again actually. Get something. Okay. It could have exactly 1,000 people in it. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I, I agree with that. Uh, that's better. Otherwise, um, I'll talk a little bit in just a second about why that's why I chose to re-roll that population. So we've got a population of about 1,000 people. Um, so why we do that is because I also use a thing that's called buying power or BP um, to determine what sorts of goods are available in any sort of settlement or anything like this. Um, so the more people you have, the, the the wider variety of goods and the more people that have that are available to buy and sell those goods. So if this is a major trading post, we probably want more people in it. Uh, so basically what that means is how we determine buying power, which we'll put down here. Uh, so buying power is just simply uh, 10 percent of the population so 100 and that's in gold pieces so we can buy anything up to 100 gold pieces at this trading post and sell anything up to 100 gold pieces uh, anything above that we're gonna have parties gonna have difficulty selling that um, so if they come across you know a ruby or something that's worth 500 gold they're probably not going to be able to find somebody at the trading post who has enough gold or has enough, you know, liquid currency to pay for that. Uh, that's when they're going to need to switch out a larger city. They're going to actually need to go to a city to offload that gold or offload that ruby or gemstone or magic item or whatever it is. Um, not, luckily, having buying power at about 100 gold means that, because we're going to use the 5e system probably for this, the solo RPG means that we'll have the opportunity to buy healing potions, which is probably the most important thing for this, when we're setting up sort of a local base of operations for, for a new campaign for solo RPG is having the ability to buy those sort of essential goods. Uh, that also means that they're, they're going to be able to buy most armors and weapons, right? And obviously, they're not going to be able to buy plate armor here, um, but they will be able to get things, I think, Scale is 75 or 100 gold, so we should be able to pick things like that up if we end up being somebody who who uh, wears heavy armor because we don't know who the characters are going to be yet. Uh, but that gives us the ability to buy probably everything we need. Um, and you know what? We've hit about an hour 
in the stream. And I think that, that is, uh, I think it's a good place, I think, for right now. Before I get too much into sort of building everything out, I think I'm going to take a short break, uh, get a little get a new drink, use the bathroom, and I'll be back very shortly. So uh, stick around, be back. Uh, if you want to drop some questions in there, I can hit those up when we get back. Uh, otherwise, you know, just give me a few minutes and I'll be back. All right, I am back. Thanks for letting me take a little bathroom break and get things situated when I got myself a little, nice little water as well.
Um, so one of the things I wanted to show off, just while thinking, um, so this is actually my DM's notebook, I, I guess folder, um, not actually a binder, um, but it's got some useful stuff in it. Um, I let my, one of my DM friends borrow it to run an exploration session uh, that we did, sort of a travel log with some things going on. Uh, over the over the weekend and he thought it was really great uh obviously i i think it's useful because it's mine and i made it <laughs> uh but if you're interested for like more information about like how to make one of these things and things like that nature uh you can you can hit up the website all that stuff's on on my blog at redraggedfiend.com you can see that down sort of like below uh but just kind of wanted to give it a little shout out if that's the sort of thing that you're interested in doing more DMing and things of that nature. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and just kind of jump back in. All right, so we we did our population and buying power, so we know sort of trading post. Um, what's a good name for this trading post now that I'm thinking about it? Uh, probably something Oasis related, perhaps, since we've got a, a nice little water source that we're working with. And this trading post. Let's go ahead and add this. The R trading post is sort of our starting area. Uh, the idea is if you have an idea, drop it in. Um, is something Oasis related? I'm not sure. Hmm. Maybe, maybe Split Valley. Since we have sort of. Looking back at our map, we have that. We had that sort of hills on one side and mountains on the other side, and we know that sort of the overall theme was that this is sort of in a depression, so maybe this was like a, maybe like a split valley oasis. That seems good. Uh, let's go ahead and pull over to that scene, just kind of start working on this stuff. Forget about it. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's make this uh, like split valley oasis. That probably sounds boring, but uh, you know, in in my defense, most place names are extremely boring, <laughs> right? It's just how we are. They're usually named after people or a feature or what the place does. Um, I mean, the places that are named something, something town, something city, right? It just kind of tells you directly what it is with some sort of identifier. Right. Uh, so I think Split Valley Oasis uh, works. It's memorable enough. I might I might change it later. We'll see what happens. But uh, that's that's where I'll be sort of for right now. Uh, so the next step in our little handy dandy guide here, uh, after we sort of figure out the population buying power, is trying to figure out, you know, what is the imminent threat? What is going on? This is sort of our call to action. Uh, for our new characters, our new adventure, right? What is our what is the imminent threat? Split Valley Oasis. Uh, we've got a 1D20 list. It's very similar to the one that's in uh, the 5E Dungeon Master's Guide that tells you that helps you like come up with histories of places, things of that that nature. That sort of sort of like took that and combined it with some very generic sort of like quest prompts or things that happen, events based sort of things. Uh, so it's 20. Uh, so for this one, I'm gonna roll 2d20 and kind of, kind of pick which one I like better. Uh, I'm in charge, I get to do that. <laughs> All right, so we got um, 10 and 18. Perfect. All right, Tin is a powerful monster. So this could be sort of maybe a wandering monster that's moved into the area, or it could be a group of monsters, right? We might have uh, like an orc warband or hobgoblins or something that have sort of moved into the area, so this is sort of a new threat. Um, but it could also be uh, a very natural monster. And again, uh, I imagine that I'll be starting this, this new sort of solo RPG campaign at level one uh so don't want to get anything too powerful uh, because i don't want to run off and get immediately killed 
Uh, but I could also set it up to be sort of like a goal during the campaign, so maybe it's something that uh, maybe a third or fourth level character is more appropriate to handling rather than a level one character. So that way you kind of need to do some little side quests and level up around the area. I mean, something to work towards. Uh, but let's look at the other one. So 18 uh, is a violent storm. Hmm. Which could mean... That's, that's a really good way to kick off a campaign is to have a violent storm just sort of rip through an area and just sort of have to survive it or find safety. That's a, that's a pretty good way to start off. It's a very immediate call to action. Um, or it could be dealing with the fallout of that. Uh, you know, trying to, you know, help survivors, search rubble, do things of that nature. Especially if that violent storm is not natural, right? Could be um, a, a really mad druid that did something, or some sort of arcane problem that's happened, or maybe some divine judgment. We don't know exactly what that violent storm is. Um, Oh, I like Violet Storm, but I also like Powerful Monster. I like both of those options. I could maybe combine them, right? A Violet Storm that's leading to a Powerful Monster? Or because of a Powerful Monster? Oh, maybe some sort of elemental? That'd be kind of cool. Maybe some sort of rogue elemental, something that's sort of gone out of control on a rampage? Seems kind of cool. I think I'm gonna go with that. Um, maybe it's an elemental, maybe it's a druid, maybe it's some sort of spellcaster, but I think, yeah, for, for now, let's go sort of the imminent threat is, you know, we'll have the storm. I am cool. monster that has moved into the air. Right, so that wasn't here before. Because right, it's our call to action. Something that's just now happening. Either happening or about to happen. So I think the storm happened, and they're just now learning about this powerful monster that's going into it. Alright, very cool. Um, so after that we need to do our VIP NPCs. The VIP NPCs are sort of the movers and shakers of this trading post area and sort of the village that takes part of it. I usually like to do three, which gives us a pretty good spread. Um, it gives us uh, some people to work with sort of right off the bat. Um, it gives us some people to interact with as characters that we know aren't just sort of like a random stable boy or whatever. So for that, and they'll have quests tied to them. Uh, I have this very wonderful, probably can't see it up on the camera, but a 1D100's NPC sheet that makes this very easy to roll on. Uh, I've used it a lot. Uh, it's in my, in this guy right here. It's in this DM's finder, uh, just because it's got, when you just need a random NPC, it's really useful. Uh, and it's got way more than 100 in it. Most, most entries have anywhere between two to six actually in it. Uh, but let's go ahead and roll and see what we get. All right, 57. What's 57 on our list? Flavor. Interesting, okay. That's kind of informing us about the setting. Uh, so slavery might be legal, might not be legal, right? Maybe this is somebody who's passing through with slaves or looking to enslave people to take to a slave market. So it may not actually be legal here. Or it might be. They'll give us some good world building stuff that we'll kind of figure on. Maybe figure out more while we're building the character and see what sort of adventures we want to take part in. Uh, see if we want to do some sort of slaving liberation thing or if this is just a background thing that's just kind of culturally understood. But uh, let's find out who our other two people are. Alright, 38. A farmer or a miller? Hmm, well, there's not 
the interesting thing is is that a farm miller doesn't necessarily work for this setting because we don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of farmland right we're basically at a at a large oasis a bunch of marshland around it I, now there is stuff that grows specifically in the marshland um and actually we have a marshland right next to actually no we can make that work we can make that work yeah we can make that work no problem so i'm going to say that this guy right this farmer but he's an important farmer so he's Really well to do. It might be more of a sort of like plantation kind of owner, um, or just because they are a mover and shaker in the community, right? That's all we know as far as VIP NPCs go is that they are movers and shakers in the community at large. Uh, so this farmer, so I think this is a rice farmer, works in the marshes. Right, and we got one more. One more guy up here. Night bug. Okay, a construction mine plantation or work camp overseer. So a foreman, somebody who's in charge of sort of a large project or um, plantation. Now we already kind of talked about maybe there's a plantation. Uh, that kind of doubles down on the same area though, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I want to do that for a start off, because that would put probably the rice farmer and a plantation overseer directly in contact with each other. Um, is there any construction? Probably, I mean, right where we are, right next to mountains, right? We do have some mountains that are relatively nearby, not immediately nearby though. Uh, well, I mean, we have the volcano, but that's still kind of a ways away like a week's journey away so I'm not sure if I want to do with that so that one maybe doesn't work quite so well for us because I don't know what construction project they would be working on here at this oasis and trading post I mean they could potentially be trying to make a bridge across it but I don't know that one doesn't quite sit right with me um, for our situation. So I'm going to roll again. All right, uh, that's zero one. Uh, so number one, a scholar or a sage. That's that's pretty easy. Uh, so yeah, we'll put down uh, probably, probably a sage of some type. Okay. Those are sort of our three NPCs for right now. And right, we'll build more into them later. We're just trying to get things down for for the moment. In addition to that, all right, so we have our three NPCs. So each of these NPCs is going to have a, is going to have um, some sort of quest associated with them. So that way, when we hit the ground running for the new campaign, we have at least three quests right off the bat that we can figure out and we don't have to sort of improvise or sort of like scrounge around for rumors or things like that. We have three dedicated people that we can identify, that we can talk to, and about a quest that's re relevant to them. All right, so one of these VIP NPCs, one of these VIP NPCs is basically the person that's in charge of the trading post. So who is that? It, can, it could be any one of these, right? We talked about the rice farmer being maybe more of a plantation owner. Uh, so that's somebody who has a lot of disposable capital, uh, probably has to buy and sell a lot of supplies. So that makes sense for them to have sort of a dedicated trading post. This may be more of a company town sort of situation. It could be the slaver. Right? There's no reason it couldn't be. Um, I don't know if I want to go hard on this on the slaver storyline right out the gate instead of being sort of like the imminent threat because then that because this person also has to tie to the imminent threat so right a, a storm caused by a powerful monster that's moved into the area that's gonna that's gonna be difficult for certainly these first two that are more trade and economic oriented uh the sage though as a sage you know um, i think he's sort of a bookworm more academic type so if I think about that, 
I'm not sure if they would be interested in running a trading post. But because I don't think they're going to be interested in running a trading post for too much, I don't think that that's probably... Maybe I'll split it up. I think the Sage sounds like the sort of person who's who would be interested in a powerful monster that causes storms. So that would tie them to the imminent threat. Directly. It's sort of our primary quest giver out the gate. But I don't think it makes sense for them to be the person who's in charge. I think it makes more sense for one of the others to be in charge. Well, that kind of leaves me stuck. So I think this this one's tied to the imminent threat, but I think one of the other two guys is in charge. Hmm. I think I like the rice farmer. I think I like the plantation owner being the person who's in charge. So I think like I think that this they own the plantation in the area growing rice. They also own the trading post, which is sort of the prime import export. And the sort of the thing that's drawing people to this area. So I think I like that. I think I enjoy that. I think that's what we're going to stay with. And I think that that person is definitely going to have interest with this, with the slaver, and then possibly the sage. Right? They're, they're going to be cross between. There's going to be reasons that these VIP NBCs talk to each other and conflicts that they're going to have with each other. I think it's pretty easy to come up with, right? Labor, you know, a plantation that requires a little labor. Is that slave labor? I don't know yet. Maybe or maybe not. Um, but I think our sage is tied to the uh, imminent threat. I think they want to know more about the creature. Uh, and maybe they want it to stop, but maybe they don't want it to be killed, which could be an interesting... Maybe they want it not necessarily... Maybe not necessarily captured. Maybe they want it, like, tagged for them to follow, like like we do with real animals in the wild and sort of, like, natural game preserves and things of that nature. Maybe they want to tag it. Like it. And regardless, he's tied to that, that imminent threat. Uh, so we need something for these other two, got yeah, these other two people to do for their first labor and our uh, NPC. Um, so each of these has, each of these characters is supposed to have a an opinion about what to do with the imminent threat. Let's just knock it out. We've kind of been talking about it, so let's just knock it out real quick. So Sage wants to. Um, Let's see, uh, I think they want to tag it. I think they just want to learn more about it. Learn more about it. Monster. Hmm. Tag it for sort of follow-up research. So they definitely don't want to kill it. Uh, I think they just want, I think our rice farmer, our plantation owner, just wants, just wants the monster to be gone. That's what they want. They want the monster to be gone. Uh, I'm going to say that that storm probably did a number on sort of their, their crop yields, on their crops, and they're pissed off about it, and they want this monster gone. Uh, any means necessary, as quickly as possible. So they want John Best. Any necessary. I don't think they care. And I think that the slaver I don't know. What do you think? I think the slaver 
definitely sees it as a threat for transporting goods, but, you know, human goods back and forth. Um, but def definitely represents a threat to their business. But I could also see another angle where maybe the slaver is opportunistic by nature. Maybe they want to capture it so they can sell it. Which would put them in direct competition with the sage. Yeah, I think I like that. Okay. That's sort of what the slaver thinks about it. They want to... I like that. I think that gives us a lot of tension, uh, which is really important, especially in the beginning, to give conflict for your NPCs sort of out of the gate. Uh, at least in my experience, it's a lot easier to do that. We're a lot more fulfilling as far as the game goes when the NPCs have conflicts amongst themselves, right? There's internal and external conflicts, right? The monster is a problem for everybody. The storms it's generating is a problem for everybody. Uh, but these people, and they're the most important people in the area, do not agree on how to deal with that threat. Our slaver wants to capture it. Alright? Uh, which puts them in direct, in direct conflict with the sage, who doesn't want to capture it. Right? They want to keep it alive. Right? Both of those want to, both people want to keep it alive and basically relocate it. Um, so it's not detrimental. Uh, and the rice farmer is the person that wants it gone fast. Uh, and the fastest way to do that is probably kill the monster. <laughs> uh, so if they, if the slaver and the sage, him and Haw, about and get, continue getting fights over the rice farmers, would get really upset because every day that you know they're not taking care of this monster, it has the potential to do more damage to his way of life, right? To his capital, to his fields, to his people, to the trading post, to his business and livelihood. I say his, but we don't know if it's a him yet. I think the rice farmer wants it good. So I think that there could be a conflict there because I think the rice farmer could potentially hire someone to just go and deal with the monster. And right, because the rice farmer is the big kahuna, right? They're the person who's in charge, right? At the end of the day, it's their call. And it's really up to the slaver and the sage to sort of, sort of, you know, do their best worm tongue impression, and give their advice, and be like, no, 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 we could, we did this other thing, and that would be good, and right. So that sets it up, and really, any of these three could hire our PC to deal with that threat. So it's, there'll be a decision to make, which is always good. Like, who do you go? It's, is some sort of ethical thing that may be right and they're each going to offer probably different rewards for what they want done um there's a potential that they could they could collect rewards from both the rice farmer and one of the other two um for taking care of the quest to kind of double dip maybe that'll get them in trouble with one or the other Depends. um but yeah i think i think that puts us in a very good spot with them all right so we know that the the sage is taking over with even the threat, but we need a couple other sort of side quest things. What then these uh these other guys do? Sleep in the rice farmer. Um, so I have a lot of different sort of adventure quest generation tools that I use, but I want to keep using this document because it's what I have in front of me. Uh, so I'm just going to roll a couple more d20, I think, and let's see uh let's see what's going to go on for these guys. It's another very useful way to sort of use this this tool is even though it's a 1d20 and you can use this for it's just sort of basic advice for dms or people playing solo rpgs by themselves um you can take any table that's a one dice roll table right whether that's a d100 or a d20 or a d4 roll on it twice use whichever result 
works best for what you want to do. Or you can combine them together, which is what we ended up doing with the imminent threat, right? To make it um, a little bit more interesting and make sure that you don't always end up with the same thing all the time. Because that takes you from uh, 20 options to you know, 20 by 20, that's 400 options, right? 400 distinct different, and still that's, assume you still have to interpret those 400 independent results so you could right you could get the same result two or three times to come up with different ways to interpret that so right it goes from 20 different objects into you know hundreds if not thousands just you know a super great you, you can use a very limited resource and get a lot of bang for your buck out of it all right so uh, up back so we're looking at the slaver we're looking at 14 which is plague or illness uh, that seems like a very very important one for somebody who deals in human trafficking right um if you're it's like a rancher with their livestock getting sick right that's a big issue a major issue um what is six so six is for an occupation which is interesting uh we could tie those together and i I don't want to do that from the start. I think organically during play, I can see those time together, right? You have a foreign occupation force that comes in that brings with it fresh diseases that people don't have immunities and antibodies for. Um, and that, that'll wreak havoc on the slaver, um, which is maybe why the slaver's looking to capture the monster instead, looking for, you know, an alternative revenue stream <laughs> to people who keep getting sick and potentially die. Uh, so yeah, I think, so, but I'm going to let those be independent, at least for right now. Uh, that's how they care about that, but let's, let's add a little thing in here. Be like, okay, so, the slaver has, sort of, plague or illness. Um... Seems callous, but we'll call it. We'll call these people merchandise <laughs> rather than slaves. <laughs> uh, that doesn't make me happy inside, but that's okay. <laughs> Trying to get the information down, um, and our rice farmer. So they have something going on with the foreign occupation. Uh, um, it could be requisitioning, right? which I think is probably common. Um, so anything that's beyond sort of like new model army, um, quick history lesson, I guess. Um, if you're a foreign invading force, uh, you live off the land, you take things from, you take things from the local populace to sustain and feed and gear up your own troops. Uh, that's very, very common, especially, especially you know, pre-modern times. So I definitely think, as a large rice farmer, right, you own a rice plantation. Uh, a foreign occupation is a big thing because sometimes they'll pay for it. Other times they just take it. <laughs> you know, if they're nice, they pay for it. Um, or if they give you a price and you don't accept their price, they just take it anyways. <laughs> Um, and they may take more or less, or it's very complicated, very, very human thing. Uh, but yeah, I like that. It gives them a lot, of, a lot of interesting things to play off. So we're already in this small area, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Which is what we want for sort of this, this starting sandbox. We want lots of, lots of individual threads for us to pull and unravel. We've got that now. All right. And these are related to, so each of these quests is related to, the other two quests are related to a nearby location. Which makes sense. They don't technically happen right where the trading post is. So let's, uh, let's hop over to the map, look at that real quick.
So we know here we have our trade pass. Go ahead and do a little thing for that. So where would it make sense for our Corvette? Right, it's not a trading post, it's a trading post. Yeehaw. Trading post. <laughs> Make that little correction. Alright. So let's just let's figure out where's our Eminem where's our monster at? Um, I think our monster our monsters in the oasis itself, but how would he get there? Well, if it was a water, it was elemental in nature. Could it just be created? Let's drop it right in the middle. I'm gonna deal with that later, but I like that it's here. Uh, so we're just gonna kind of drop that that monster icon in the middle, and that'll be our imminent threat monster. So this could be a monster, it could be an elemental, it could be some sort of aquatic or amphibious thing that's moved into the area that has some sort of random control over water. It could be, like we talked about a druid earlier, it could be a druid that's sort of hiding out somewhere. Remember though, though this square, this square, this hex itself looks like it's just a water-based hex, remember that this is a league across. So it, each hex is more than a mile across. So there could just be a tiny little island out there that some mad druid has tormented himself up on. <laughs> and he's like, I'm gonna make a bunch of storms because I hate people and motivation we don't know yet. Um, but it could also be an elemental or something else that's just found its way here. It could be something that's come down from the mountains because obviously this this basin has to fill some way. That water comes from somewhere, um, which could be which could be surface water or it could be underground. Uh, we got we got those mountains around us. You know things come come down, uh, sort of like panning for gold. Maybe it's something that's deep and dank from within the mountains nearby. But maybe even from the volcano that something the volcano is disrupted and maybe that's why the monster's mad. Don't know yet. We gotta figure that out later. Um, but we have that, and we also need a place, so we need a place for our occupation force. I think it makes sense for that occupation force to be huddled up. Here. It makes sense for that occupation force to be sort of Huddled up here on that very southwest most spit because next to that next to that spit we have the desert sort of to the southwest of there so they're sort of pushed up against this one sort of freshwater oasis area and you get water and maybe they're occupying this area Maybe they're going to try to take over the trade post, so maybe that's actually the imminent threat, but we don't know it's the imminent threat yet. Nobody does, and certainly our character doesn't. But that could turn into a much larger threat, um, which is really good. That, that could be a really good sort of like fodder for level 2, 3, 4 adventuring. It's sort of this occupation force trying to take over the trading post and plantation in the area. Um, and we need... I am losing my mind. What is the other thing we need? Oh, right, we need the slaver. Hmm. Okay, well, my assumption is. My assumption is is that our our rice farmer is probably over in these marsh hexes. 
it doesn't give us a lot of dry land to work with as far as what we're gonna do what we're gonna do with what are we gonna do with the slaver where's he ending up his people it's probably not at the trade post um i think that makes it way too easy for people to get away or find you know Fundamental people who will help them. I think he wants to isolate those people. So he and presumably a slaving crew keep a better eye on them. But there's just not a lot of of area to do that. I guess down at the south, because at this at the very south marsh, it points off into we've got some wooded area to the to the southeast um that maybe they could use for like pens and things like that they can clear some land and do stuff like that use it to actually build sort of a base of operations but it also keeps them out of the desert or we could go to the northeast uh, I think, well, when I can't decide, let's roll. So let's say, are they going to be in the northeast? Are they actually going to be outside that starting hex? So maybe the slaver's not something we deal with immediately, right? Just use the 1d20 oracle roll on anything that's 13 or above, that's yes. Anything that's eight or below, it's no. Anything that's sort of in that nine to twelve middle range uh, is yes or no. But uh, so we got a yes. So yes. Eh, let's say let's just say how many how many squares in the northeast? Just one. Okay, we can do that. No problem. All right. So we know that we'll just make that square real quick and it kind of stick out here. So boop. there it is. Uh, you know, just just to do what we're supposed to be doing. Look two d six real quick. Four. Okay. So it would be more, twice more room. Okay. Is that right? Yes, four twice more room. Okay, so we went from sort of a scrub area to the grassland. So we have that, just like we were talking about. We have that sort of dry forest. Which is exactly what we're looking for. And so that's going to be sort of our slavers camp. Um, there is. We have a super good icon for that. Hmm. We'll just leave it as a question mark for right now. Yeah, let's just leave it as a question mark. Switch that back over to the amp tool. Oop. Put that in here. And yes, I know. I'll forget if I don't leave. I'll look at that question mark later and be like, what's a question mark? Uh, so let's put that in also. Slavers amp. Not the amp. That's a different kind of life. Um, Slavers camp. Perfect. Might as well name all these things while I'm thinking about it. We are Rex Plantation. And then down here, I mean, I, I feel like Monster Icon, we're going to know what the Monster Icon means. Monster Icon means monster. Uh, but down here, we're going to do foreign occupation. Because I don't know how. Well, they're new. They shouldn't be too established. Uh, so we'll just say foreign occupation. Um, I'm thinking more, we say camp, but not necessarily like just a campfire with some tents. I'm thinking maybe more like, like a Roman Castra, or like if you've played The Witcher 3 at the Nilfgaardian War Camp, like it's 
size, well, not nearly as large as Nefkardia War Camp. That thing's huge. Uh, that's not really appropriate for the level of adventure we're doing. Um, but something, some sort of a bivouac that's got uh, a semi-permanent camp that's probably got like a palisade that they made or something like that. So it's it's more than just some tents, right? This is there are people that have the potential for requisitioning a lot of rice uh, to feed their people. Um, that can put a real dent in our farmers' way of life. Uh, which they are key to sort of get rid of. Now the nice thing is is that we have sort of this large waterway, which means that probably a lot of this travel that we're going to end up doing is probably going to be boat-based. Maybe in like rowboats or canoes or things of that nature, rather than walking all the way around these lakes to get to places. It'll be interesting. I, I love that stuff. Um, as a, just for a personal story, I've done backpacking and backpacking with sort of multi-week canoe trips. Um, so I enjoy that stuff, and I love bringing like experiences that I've had, um, and camping and backpacking and doing those sorts of uh, outdoor stuff, and sort of bringing that experience and that sort of thing to the table. It'll be really interesting because uh, it's a really good way to make exploration and just basic travel more interesting uh, because it's more difficult to get to just get to places when you have to add a, some other mode of transportation other than your feet <laughs> to the mix. Um, so that'll give us a lot of things, especially because a lot of this transportation, if we do it by boat, has the potential of brushing up against that monster that we drop down right in the middle of this lake middle of this oasis um, so that could really wreck things so no wonder this is a threat this is something that people are like legitimately dealing with all the time uh, so great I, I really enjoy that all right so I want to finish off by making a making a few other sort of local local locations sort of in the surrounding area for us to go to and then we'll go through all the biome stuff at this point i think we're, we're running a little bit long so i'll probably wrap it up after this um and i'll work on sort of fleshing out the details and doing that other stuff sort of later but um it gives us some some additional points of interest of places that we can go and people we can talk to um and places that can be related to the quest that we've laid out as well as any additional rumors and other stuff that we want to pull into later or if we we flub up flub things up or you know my pc really screws something up and needs to like leave town in the middle of the night uh it's nice to have an idea of like oh there's a place you could go um if i needed to do that sort of in the middle of the session <laughs> so let's do that i mean to the to the northeast, we already have the slavers camp, so we don't need to do that one. Let's sort of do our southeast, and these are, let me... These are just more d20 rolls. Nine. Okay, some sort of meeting place. Oh wait, and how far away is this? meeting place that's by all right uh, here's all we need to do we need to do like uh what are we gonna use for meeting place this all right and wait how many five okay so uh just kind of go off the middle here one two three four five uh, right here So I don't know how to get there or what's in the way first, but we do know that well, this way is a meeting place. It could be sort of like a tribal moot. It could be um, sort of a pop-up market grounds. People, just a place where people meet and exchange ideas or talk about things. It could be of some cultural importance. 
Um, if you if you read fantasy novels or look at old play things, um, like a place where you would have like a Viking moot or stuff like that, that's just a place where people come together to to meet up and discuss issues. They may pass judgments. They could do a lot of different things. Then we got to the south. Oh, 20. Some sort of hazard. Hmm. Also five. Yep. This. Okay. Yeah, actually, this guy. All right, one, two, three, four, five. Let's put it here. And write ourselves a little note for it so we can remember it later. That is going to be some sort of hazard. I don't know. Could be natural, could be magical. We don't know yet. Um, and you'll come across that a lot if you do a lot of solo RPGs or just if you're a DM prepping for session. Like, just put the minimum amount of information you need to it. And as that becomes more important, we'll flesh out the details of it. Like, I don't need to know if this hazard is, um, I don't know, some sort of natural hazard. Uh, it could be like a wildfire or something. Or if it's some sort of magic thing. Maybe it's some sort of anti-magic zone or something like that. It could be some sort of supernatural plague or, who knows. Um, so we don't need to know that at this point. We just need to know that, hey, the hazard that way, which could be adventures for later. One. Okay, we got a settlement. And we grab our little icon, and that is seven away, so. Four, five, six, seven. Okay, so that's way over there. We've got some sort of settlement. So we're dealing at the lowest level, which means that this is going to be um, a hamlet of some type. Um, we don't really need to do, I don't need to roll up the actual population right now, but I do know that um, in my own work, it's, it's smaller than the village. Um, so it is somewhere in the 50 to 400 occupant range looks pretty small it's really quite small it's basically maybe only be even two to three families just living together maybe a clan or something of that nature all right three and eight isolated homestead Guy right here that was eight away so two three four five six and eight ah, also quite far away we don't know who lists this isolated homestead yet again details as necessary um so that way we can we can do as little prep as we need to sort of kind of get into the game without feeling lost but at the same time i don't need to know everything about every every place like, we don't even know how to get there right now. What's the, what's the optimal path for getting there? Go ahead and... Bottom. Oh, sad. I was going to say, isolated settlement. They're all isolated settlements. We're in BFE. Fantasy BFE. All right. And our final one, oh, another 20, another hazard. Do I want to do another hazard? I kind of want to mix it up to the start, at least. Five. Okay, the travel hated. Also eight. Everything got really far away. <laughs> That's okay. But now I know if my PC really, really screws up and needs to get away, they can probably go to this travel haven. Um, if I could tell you. I'll tell you a little bit more about what a travel haven is. I won't drop our little thing in. I don't have enough room to do that. 
I'm gonna close that. One, two, three, four, five. I'm just gonna make it five. I don't really have enough northward to go with the full eight. I'm just gonna stick it there for right now. Right, and this is a travel haven. So a travel haven is basically a wayside inn. Um, it's sort of if you want to imagine the birth of the trading post that is our sort of central thing before that grew a village grew up around that before the to both assist with the trading post and do trade and assist with the rice plantation it was just a place where people were kind of going through well that's what this travel haven is so right now it's a travel haven so it's a small one it could be an inn. I think there's some other options. I think there are other options. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, so it could be a high traffic camp. Hmm. Do I want it to just be a straight in? I kind of like the high traffic camp better. Because we've already established this is a relatively remote area. Um, and north of here is not super great land for sort of permanent, permanent living. Um, we also have another foreign patient camp to the south. Uh, and we do know a lot of trade comes through here, so I think it may, we'll just leave this. So this is probably an inn. We don't need to fill that out right now. Um, but it is probably an inn. Probably, uh, eh. We're already talking about it. Might as well put it in there. Make it official. This is Traveler Inn. So over time, assuming that like this trade route continues between the trading posts and other places to the north, um, if we look at that sort of atlas on the far top left, we see that sort of it comes out of this sort of split valley. Maybe it goes back out into an a more broad sort of plains area or maybe there's more desert that's going on over there um but it does make it sense that sort of we see travel kind of coming through north to south and south to north like that so i think it makes sense that there's travel in there and assuming that that travel continues to go as the trading post is more prosperous as the rice plantation is more prosperous um, what starts off as a Traveler Inn now, it's just sort of an inn by itself, uh, can grow itself into a hamlet, into a village, maybe even into a town or a city in its own right, um, to support sort of that trade that comes back and forth, right? That's good because it's only in, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's only technically six X's away from uh, our current training post, or sort of our current base of operations, which makes it a really good sort of length. Um, assuming these are leagues, right? Each each hex is a league, so about an hour of travel. So it takes about six hours to get back and forth between them. Uh, makes it a really almost overnight trip, maybe a day trip if you really push it. Um, assuming that you, you do stuff once you get there. Uh, there may be enough time. You'd have to leave really early in the morning, though, to walk, presumably walk six hours, do the business that you're going to do, and walk six hours back home. But possible. But it does put it in the range that makes sense for an in between the next sort of leg of the journey. So if you were traveling a day, you would probably travel a day there. Um, if you were going to continue south, you might walk all the way around a sort of oasis lake or you might um, there might be a ferry you might take a ferry across which makes sense there's probably a ferry too we haven't rolled a ferry but there's probably a ferry um but i think that's a good place for us to sort of eh, is there anything else i need to add because we're kind of at the end of my sheet here all right uh actually we are pretty much at the end the only thing that it has in here is a reminder for me and a reminder for sort of any any DM about building sort of settlements and locations for your world. 
um, is that there are a few player character needs that most sort of settlements have that you need to sort of address. So you need um, some way for your party or player characters to exchange information to get quests and offload quests. Right, that's what we're doing. That's why we have this sort of central base of operations that we can, you know, use as sort of a jumping off point and then coming back to to uh, return our quest right out the gate. Uh, so I think the training post very much accomplishes that. Uh, we have three VIP NPCs that are connected that have things going on. We've got some points that we've got stuck around the world so far that we can address. Um, that can that may or may not be connected to this quest that we talked about. Um, the, the second thing we want to do is make sure that there's a place for room and board. Uh, this is a, a village with a thousand people and, and, a, and a relatively major major trading post. There's going to be at least an inn. Uh, there's going to be a place for them to stay. There's going to be a way for them. Um, in a way, yeah. There's going to be certainly a place for them to get hot meals and to have a relatively safe place to sleep in a bed with a locked door. Um, so the other thing we're going to look at for as a location need, our sort of central location, is they need the opportunity to buy and sell things, even if that's extremely limited. Um, but you don't want to put a settlement or something in a position where there's not even enough money for your PCs to buy things like oil for their lamps or rations. Like you need some of those very, very basic things, which don't cost a lot of money. Um, and that doesn't necessarily need to be paid for in money either. Right, that it could be instead, uh, instead of paying money, maybe they have to, maybe it's more of a barter situation or good faith services. Where it's like, oh, you know, this place, and maybe it's a little hamlet that doesn't have like a lot of actual physical money to trade things back and forth, but they can trade you maybe trade goods in exchange for favors done or, um, you know, allow basically give it for services rendered rather than uh, exchanging something valuable for money or money for a valuable. Be like, oh, yes. Um, if you do this thing for me, I will give you this thing. Which could be helpful. Uh, and it gives you... It gives the player characters the ability to sort of talk with more normal people, right? Actually sort of like engage in the local environment and the people who live there. Which is very crucial for sort of getting your players invested. And the last thing for sort of a hub settlement that we want to take account of is that we need a place for the for our players um, and our player characters to be able to take part in some sort of downtime activities. Right, we know there's a trading post, we know there's an inn. Uh, there's also a lot going on, right? It's a pretty major trading post. Uh, people would be, your players would be able to spend time trying to get items crafted. Uh, to try to buy and sell magic weapons, they could try to find some of that, and um, they might not have too much success because, again, this isn't a city. It's still, like a village, it's a large village, but it's still a village, even though it has a pretty major trading post. Um, but it also gives them the ability to like work on trying to learn proficiencies and places to level up that make sense. Um, but yeah, that's sort of what you're looking for in sort of like the hub settlement when you're starting off a new campaign. Or at least that's what I try to build for that. So it's sort of a self-contained unit. So basically when you set up all the disparate pieces so that way the campaign can just kind of run itself. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. And this seems like a really good place, I think, to just sort of wrap up. So let's go ahead and put this aside and just pop back over here. Dude. All right. Well, uh, thank you for stopping by, for hanging out, for getting things done with me. Uh, it's been 
It's been a learning curve. This whole thing's gonna be a, a continual learning curve for me. Uh, brand new to doing the whole streaming thing. So hopefully it's it's entertaining enough. That's my hope. Uh, I I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, more fun than I thought I would. So that's always good. So that kind of gets me juiced to do this again. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rhett, we've got we've got the the social down there. Hit me up on Twitter. Give me a follow. Uh, follow the channel. Uh, I'm gonna try to stream. I'm still trying to figure out the schedule right now, but I think I'm gonna try to stream right in this sort of block, sort of in Sunday afternoons. That's sort of the best time for me. Uh, I may do some improvised streams. May go live improvised throughout the week. It, you know, as I have availability and stuff to talk about or stuff that I want to go over. Uh, but I think this is gonna be sort of the prime streaming time for right now. I just haven't put that. You know down in ink yet i haven't made it official but that's sort of where we're at right now um let's see what else to talk about um so i think we, we got everything done that i wanted to get done today All right i think we we ach we achieve you know setting up the foundation area as well as some foundational quests and some tension between npcs and stuff that's going on so that way when we hop in up into the world we'll have stuff to do which is what we want um so i think we accomplished our goal as far as that's concerned i'm i'm excited to see sort of how it goes i'm excited to find out what the monster is honestly <laughs> i don't know right we still don't know a ton about the imminent threat but it does sort of give us some ideas about what's going on um but i think that that sort of Sort of informs us as to what I'm going to work on next time. I think next time I'm going to jump into character creation. Uh, so I've done solo RPGs a few times before. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I did, it's, it, and I think you, you'll you find it a lot of fun too if you enjoy talking to yourself. Um, if you're okay with that, then you're going to, you're probably going to enjoy solo RPGs if you have that ability to sort of like entertain yourself in that sort of way. But, you know, with, with some people watching, you know, going to be a lot more fun, I think. Uh, it'll get some feedback on there and help help me make some decisions, especially when I, if I get stuck on something or I'm not sure what to do. Uh, but I think next time, now that we kind of know about the starting setting and, like, what, the, what that is, we, we're informed a little bit about the people and the rules. Um, we'll have to figure out whether the character's okay with slavery or not. We'll find that out real quick, and maybe that'll inform us in sort of like a larger cultural idea as to who's okay with slavery and who's not. Uh, but that does that does sort of give us a, a jumping off point so I can kind of figure out who it is. I may make, in the next stream, thing on time, I may make a sidekick as well. Um, I really enjoy the 5e sidekick rules, and they're really, really useful for doing solo RPG content. Um, because... Right, D and D. At, at the end of the day, the way that D and D classes and everything are set up, it is a team game. Right, it's a cooperative team game. Um, right, you need uh, just just like if you were playing WoW or something else like that. Right, you want tanks and damage dealers and controllers and healers and buffers. Um, and so when you when you only go in with one character, you only kind of fill one of those roles. M maybe or at least until you get to probably third level and you can take sort of a an archetype so that allows you to sort of like dip a little bit into another thing right you can go you can be a fighter that casts some spells right so that kind of gives you some of that arcane background uh, but it's really helpful to have a sidekick character or multiple sidekick characters that kind of a cast of sidekick characters that kind of come in and out of the adventures that help you account for those things that your character's not good at. Um, not necessarily, at the end of the day, they're sidekicks, so they're not full player characters, so they're not going to feel the limelight most of the time. They're going to put you in a position where you are hopefully not going to run into a dead end because you can't do something, especially when you're doing a lot of improvisation. Like, if I decide to run a fighter, and that fighter runs into um what's a door with an arcane lock on it well my fighter's just you know sol like what am i supposed to do with that 
um, I can try to break it down, but then you have to go into, all right, well, can you can you break down something that's shielded with magic with mundane weapons, yes or no, or various things, but if I had a sidekick that, you know, maybe doesn't necessarily have to knock, but can at least identify that and can kind of come up with a way that we can get around it, um, that's extremely helpful, or, you know, having a character that can help heal um, is always nice, right? It gives the survivability because, again, I'm probably going to start at level 1 uh, just because I love the low levels of D&D so much um, and sort of scrappy, the, the plucky heroes. And before they sort of ramp up and become sort of superhero level people that, you know, are, are kind, of, kind of, in my mind, kind of becomes a situation like the show The Boys, where they're just like, can the hut... They cannot see themselves as normal humans anymore. Like their their abilities put them so far away from what it means to be a normal human in the setting. Uh, but at low levels, uh, they're just powerful scrubs, right? They're just a little bit smarter, a little bit faster. They've got a little bit more knowledge um, than the average person. Uh, so I really like that, but they still have a lot of trouble with very sort of mundane problems. Uh, and things they can't just sort of hand wave away yet. Uh, so I like to start there so at least the characters feel grounded sort of out the gate. And feel like they have to work with the setting rather than just kind of bulldoze it over. But uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much it everything is there anything i haven't mentioned oh uh so i don't again i'm still slow over time you're gonna see there's a lot of jank in, in the stream setup we're gonna get that sort of sorted out but i wanted to do that iteratively um as i kind of continue moving on this because i'd rather get started and fix things as i go rather than what you know get stuck planning to make everything perfect for that first stream and never actually end up streaming. <laughs> uh, so, right, and I'm still learning this stuff as I'm going, very much, very much neophyte in that, in that sense. Uh, so I'm still pulling things together so I don't have, like, the stream schedule up. I don't have a whole bunch of stuff set up on Twitch yet, but I'm going to get there. I'm going to make those slow changes. Uh, that's sort of my approach, is that I'm going to stream, look at what I learned from the stream, and as I do, sort of build things up rather than... Try to build up an entire amount of things and then start streaming that's sort of my idea but if you're looking for uh you know more stuff about me you can check out the website again it's down there at the bottom uh hit me up on twitter uh that'll that'll give you ability to follow me follow my twitch and you can you can check out all that stuff you, especially if you go to the website the website's the best best spot because you can get all that other stuff uh, as well as you can find, I, I have some pay what you want things on drive through RPG. You can go check those out um, and you can support me either with downloads and sharing stuff and make sure to share stuff on social media or uh, also have a, a coffee or coffee link that's on the website that I haven't uploaded to Twitch yet. So if you want to you know, become sort of a regular follower and build it up that way, you can you can definitely do it that way. Um, I prefer Kofi over Twitch. Patreon, because of Patreon's sort of um, not so great ethical business practices um, and sort of the content they've engaged with in the past. Uh, so that's why I use Kofi instead of the Patreon. Uh, but who knows? I mean, I know people are more familiar with the Patreon platform, so it may be something I do in the future. Uh, but I would, I would like to not do that if I can avoid it. Uh, but that's it for me. Um, I should be streaming next Sunday. That's the plan. Uh, but until then, you know, hey, thanks for thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming along on this ride with me. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to probably make those characters and get started there. Um, and yeah. Well, we'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>